Hi everyone, and welcome to the introductory lectures for Linguistics 101 online. In this first section, we'll be looking at what is language, we'll be looking at some facts about languages in general, and we'll also be looking at what is linguistics. This first set of little lectures will roughly correspond to chapter one in the textbook if you have it. If you don't have the textbook, that's totally fine, and you should be able to get by without too much of a problem. I've tried to break this up into a few different sections, kind of shorter videos, and you should be able to find those in the appropriate place on the course module. I've also put up the slides in a single file, so you can find them all in one place just for your convenience. In this first little lecture, mini lecture, we'll be looking at what is language. So that's kind of a tough question to answer, like what is language? That's a pretty big question. Um, so one way that people have defined language is as a complex system for organizing and expressing information. So we kind of organize our thoughts and express them through this thing called language. Language is a pretty widespread and a pretty essential part of our own lives and the lives of humans in general. Language, as we will look at it, is a specifically human trait, so something that animals don't really have. Um, it's also very structured and very systematic, and it's also dynamic and adaptable and has a lot of cultural aspects as well. So looking at that first kind of assertion that language is a very human thing, um, language is one of the defining traits of humankind. It's something that no other animal species really has. Um, so other animal species do have forms of communication, but they're not really comparable to human language. So one example that kind of shows animal communication as being different from human language is that there's not a known system of animal communication that can represent uh, things that happen in the future or things that are hypothetical. So um, even though, for example, some animals can indicate that they're hungry, um, that's indicating that they're hungry now and not that they're hungry in the future. So um, basically animal communication can re not represent things in the future or hypothetical things, but human language can do that. Um, there are definitely other ways that um, animal communication differs from human language. This is just one example. Um, so language is also very embedded in our physiology um, as humans. So um, we're kind of very biologically adapted to use language. Um, language is embedded into our cognition, so our brains are kind of um, adapted to use language as well. And uh, so our kind of general awareness and general thought processes are very much adapted to using language. So language, as we use it as humans, is both functional and interactional. So it's functional in the way that we as language users use it to perform actions such as requests. So uh, I can ask my friend to loan me $20. We can use it as a way to perform rejections. Uh, so my friend can say, I don't want to loan you $20. We can use it um, to make a complaint. I can say, well, you are a jerk for not loaning me $20. And we can also use it to make assessments. Uh, so um, my friend could like assess that, well, um, you should have saved money so I wouldn't have to loan you $20. So there are all these different functions that we can use to 
that we can use language to to perform. Um, so language is functional in the way that we can use it to perform specific actions. Language is also interactional in that the interactions that we're in can shape language um, by the way that we will choose different words and different linguistic structures depending on how the interaction is going. So one example of this is that if I'm talking to my grandmother, I might use a completely different set of vocabulary than if I'm talking to, say, a friend at a New Year's party or something like that. So when I'm talking to my grandmother, I might say things more formally. When I'm talking to a friend, I might say things more informally. So one example that is another way that um, language as humans use it differs from the way that animals communicate more generally is that human language uses recursion. So one thing that we can do is I can say that I said, that you said, that he said, that this is the dog who scared the cat, who saw the mouse, who blah, blah, blah. So basically what we're doing there is we are embedding sentences and embedding phrases within other sentences and phrases. Animal communication doesn't typically do that. So this form of recursion that we use can in theory go on to infinity. Like I could say, I said that you said that he said that she said that uh, my best friend said that the president said and so on. We can basically keep doing that forever. And it still will make sense um, as long as we have the memory to keep track of all of the stuff that was going on there. So that's not something we really see in animal language either. Um, another thing that we can do with language as humans that animals don't really do is what's called extension of functions. So um, we have these phrases, things like way too much or way up high to show that we have um, kind of an excess of something, so way too much of something, or something is excessively high, so something is very, um, very far from us on a vertical dimension. And we can kind of extend this meaning to show that something is excessively far away, or physically there is some excess of this thing. We can extend this and say that something is, for example, way cool. So something is very cool. So way in this sense has been extended from um, these first couple of meanings to some kind of general, um, to some kind of general term that is along the lines of very or really. So we can say something's very cool or really cool or way cool. Those all have kind of a similar meaning. And what we've done there is we've extended the use of the word way into further uses. So you don't see that a lot in animal communication, this extension of function. So basically it's kind of structured to take advantage of human creativity here. Um, Animals tend to just not be able to do this. They don't necessarily have the same creative capacity that humans really do. Um, so this is kind of getting a little farther away um, from what separates human communication from animal communication. But human language is structured and systematic. Um, some forms of animal communication also can be structured and systematic. So. Systematic distribution of sounds is one way that human language can be very structured um, and systematic. As we'll see in a future uh, set of lectures, um, these two words, spit and pit, actually have two different forms of the sound that is represented by the letter P in English. So we'll look more at that in future weeks, but basically, um, the P sound in spit 
does not have a little puff of air after the P that the P sound in pit does happen to have. So if you kind of hold your hand in front of your mouth and say spit, and then hold your hand in front of, in front of your mouth and say pit, you may notice a little puff of air when you say pit. So that's something we'll look at in future weeks. There's kind of a reason for that. But basically the sounds in English do have a kind of systematic distribution. Um, there's also a systematic way that we form the past tense in English, typically. Um, so if I put some cookies in the oven, but I did it two hours ago, I baked them. Um, if I found an old lamp and I thought there was a genie in it, then I rubbed it. Um, if someone was late to meet me for dinner, then I waited for them. Um, so basically, we had this ED thing on the end of words in English, and that tends to turn them into a past tense verb. Um, so that's so systematic that when we look at um, fake words, we can even do that with fake words. So um, it's easy enough to say it with real words like bake becomes baked, rub becomes rubbed, wait becomes waited. But if we have fake words, like for example, smip, we can say smipped, or croom, we can say croomed, or plute, we can say pluted. So some things are so systematic that when we make up fake words or new words, um, it's really easy to continue the system with those, um, with those words. So another way that language is structured and systematic is that we have a hierarchy of um, kind of layers of language. So language at its most basic form is kind of a set of sounds that we say. So these sounds can, can combine to form roots or affixes. So basically these sounds combine to form smaller parts of words. So an, an affix would be something like the past tense ending that we stick on verbs and the root would be the verb itself. So um, these sounds can combine to form these parts of words. Uh, these parts of words combine to form full words. These full words can form phrases. These phrases can form clauses. These clauses can form sentences. And these sentences can form you know, larger things like paragraphs or speeches or stories or things like that. So um, another way that language is structured and systematic is that it's very conventionalized. So in certain speech communities, so um, basically in certain uh, social groups or things like that, we have specific systems of word usage and sound patterns and grammatical structures that we use. So basically, I might use different words or sounds or grammatical rules when I'm talking to one group versus when I'm talking to another. Uh, and you may do the same thing. If you have maybe a, a job outside of school, you might talk one way when you're there. And when you're with your family, you might talk another way. When you're with your friends, you may talk a, yet again another way. So there's basically a whole bunch of different conventions in language that are actually pretty systematic when we end up looking at them. So um, one other aspect of language in general to consider is that language is relatively arbitrary. So what we mean here is that the form of language and the meaning of language are not necessarily linked together. So one example of this is that um, we have this concept of a freestanding dwelling where people live. So in English, uh, we could say that concept is described by the word house. But is there a reason we use the word house in English? Um, well, not really. It's just the word that we happen to use to describe this concept. If we look at these other languages like Aztec or French or German or Russian, or Spanish, we have all these different words that describe this concept of house. And if you look at all these words that describe the concept for house, none of them are really all that similar to the other ones. 
So in some languages, we may indeed see similar uh, forms to describe the same meaning in another language. But um, from just this small selection of languages, we can see that it's not necessarily going to be a widespread thing. We have, um, I guess, about 10 different languages here and then 10 different words to describe this concept. So um, basically, the form or the word that we use in English or any other language is not necessarily linked to the meaning that it will describe. So another aspect of language, in addition to being arbitrary, is that it is dynamic. So we've already talked a bit about how language can vary across social groups. So our choice of words, the style we talk in, the level of formality we use, the different dialects we use, these can all vary across social groups. Um, this variation is socially meaningful. So what that means is we kind of use it to uh, kind of show that we belong to a certain group or don't belong to a certain group or things like that. It can kind of be used by people to signal social status in a way. Uh, another way that language is dynamic um, is that new words are coming in all the time. So in addition to kind of varying over social groups, um, so kind of at a single time it can vary across social groups, language can actually change within a social group as well as time goes on. So new words can come into a language all the time. If we go back 20 years ago, Nobody would have heard of the word iPod. No one would have known what a podcast was. No one would know what twerking was or taking a selfie or things like that. So there are all these new words that come into language. And this happens constantly. We also do see old words fall out of use. So hogshead was a unit of volume, I think, from a long time ago. No one really uses hogshead anymore. No one also uses fleam, and no one uses snath. Um, so those are all words that have fallen out of use. We also can see words that stay in use, but not necessarily in the same meanings. So um, here I've given you the example of weed. At one point it meant clothes that were worn during mourning, so like clothes you might wear at a funeral and afterwards. Um, today weed has a few different meanings than that. You know, it has the, you know, meaning like the plants that you pull out of your lawn. And it has, you know, the meaning, kind of the drug meaning as well. So um, there are definitely um, changes going on in language all the time. So basically this process of change is just always going on. And um, it some people can sometimes be resistant to it but it happens anyway. So basically language is constantly changing is the point here. Um, so kind of a few examples of that. Um, I have an example from Shakespeare here um, where he says, now fie upon my false French, um, etc." So this example from Shakespeare, the language does seem kind of dated, but you can still understand it relatively well. If you look at the second example, it's from um, the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. That's actually a lot harder to understand. Um, in fact, I kind of lose what it's saying um, at some point. Um, so I don't entirely know what it means off the top of my head. So basically, these are both forms of English that are a couple hundred years apart, um, kind of showing you that English definitely has changed um, over the course of those couple hundred years, and it has changed ch since Shakespeare as well. Um, so here's another example. Um, we have a part of the Lord's Prayer in Old English from around 1000 AD, uh, Middle English from 1400, and then kind of more modern American English. Um, or kind of a colloquial American English. So if you look at the Old English, 
it's really hard to know what that's saying. If you look at the Middle English, it becomes a little bit more recognizable. You can kind of see where we might see our father. Um, the word that probably corresponds to heaven is there, uh, hallowed, and name. Um, when we look at colloquial American English, we can understand it just fine. Um, so basically, these are different forms of English um, saying the same thing a few hundred years apart each. And just kind of just kind of showing you that language is dynamic and changing. So, um, in addition to changing all the time, and having all the the previous properties we talked about, language is typically very culturally relevant. So, um, cultures tend to value their languages a lot, uh, as much as they value other traditions like holidays, or um, religious um, religious rituals, things like that. Um, so language tends to be very culturally relevant, and the structure of a language can sometimes reflect the culture in which it is used. So um, if a language tends to value um, a certain uh, resource quite a bit, they may have more words kind of concerning that resource. Um, so you may have heard that myth of uh, kind of Eskimo cultures having a lot of words for snow. Um, to some extent that's true, not fully, uh, which we may talk about later, but um, that's kind of the idea that this is describing. Um, so that's kind of one way that um, language is culturally relevant. Another way that language is culturally relevant is kind of how its speakers define it. So to kind of illustrate this, we'll look at um, what is the distinction between a dialect and a language. So um, you may have heard both the term dialect and the term language before. Uh, so a dialect is when we have two varieties of kind of the same language uh, so these varieties will differ a bit in terms of vocabulary and grammar, but they will still, for the most part, be understandable to the speakers of, the, of each other. Um, so a lang when we have two different languages, um, typically they won't be understandable to the speakers of these two different languages, as opposed, as opposed to the two different dialects where you can probably understand the speaker of the other dialect. So um, that's kind of the usual way we would define it. There are also um, kind of political ways you can define a dialect versus a language. So different criteria will lead to different results for this though. So some of you may have heard the Chinese languages in general being referred to as Chinese. So for example, you may have heard Mandarin and Cantonese referred to as different dialects of Chinese. So Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, as defined by a lot of linguists, would actually be considered different languages. And that's because they're not mutually intelligible. So what that means is that a speaker of Mandarin won't be able to understand a speaker of Cantonese um, unless they also happen to speak Cantonese. Um, so man knowing Mandarin in and of itself is not enough to understand Cantonese. Um, so despite that, for political uh, reasons, um, Mandarin and Cantonese are referred to as two dialects of the same language. You kind of see an opposite thing happen with uh, Serbo-Croatian. So Serbian and Croatian are very frequently, at least in some areas, referred to as uh, different languages. So Serbian as one language and Croatian as another. Um, however, linguistically, they are very mutually intelligible. So if you speak Serbian fluently, then very likely you will also be able to understand Croatian. So linguistically, um, Serbian and Croatian would be frequently considered one language, 
um, as opposed to in Chinese, where we see Mandarin and Cantonese, rather than being considered two dialects, they are really kind of linguistically two different languages. But Serbian and Croatian, despite for political reasons being considered two different languages, are linguistically kind of dialects of the same language. So um, basically we have these two different um, situations here that have led to two different definitions of dialect and language. So this is kind of the end of the first little um, lecture section. Um, there will be two more sections to look at. Um, so